All right, here we are, episode 28, I think, yeah, episode 28 of Merryweather's World. Uh, as usual, we have the ever-popular and growing more popular than me, that, Miniweather. That's a lie. And then also, oops, let me just take the camera here. Uh, if we can see her over here, Everyone. we have another assistant to be named when we come up with a clever name for her. Okay, you can fix that. <laughs> So tonight, uh, as usual, my name is Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbruggen. I am your host. Uh, we'll be talking about the books I, as a forager, use to figure out what plants uh, there are out there. Uh, if I'm faced with a new plant that I'm, I don't recognize, these are the things that help me figure out uh, what it is and how to use it in an edible or, if we have time, even a medicinal manner. So, I uh, probably said this for the third time, but without any further ado, let's start working with the books. So, my lovely assistant will be handing them. Starting with The Idiot's Guide Foraging. And if you can see here, yes, this is me. So, obviously, you're thinking, of course, he's going to push his book. But let me explain why this is one of the most awesome foraging books out there. Before I do that, let me explain the way The Idiot's Guide series works. Is that they find an idiot to write a book for them. Um, I actually don't get any royalties from this book, so if you buy it anywhere other than my specific Amazon shop, I get nothing for this. Um, that being said, uh, last time I heard it was the top in the top three best-selling Idiot's Guides ever. But I got diddly. So why do I think this is... Well, I designed it to be the, the hopefully the best foraging book out there. Uh, first off, it's not just Texas. It covers all of North America. In fact, every plant has a little map showing where in the North America region you can find it. And in the back, there is a calendar showing each plant. And depending on where you are in North America, when you would look for it. There's also 30 recipes. Now, I will say I did not do the recipes. I subcontracted that out because I was given three months to write this book. Uh, so the, the recipes were things uh, that someone else came up with to help support the book. But then how is the book laid out? Well, each plant has two page spread, big pictures. Uh, if there's a toxic mimic, how to tell it apart. Things like that. Useful information, what the leaf looks like, what the flower looks like, what the stalk looks like, what the branches, what the leaves, all these sort of things. But it covers 70 books, uh, sorry, 70 plants. These plants are found, uh, like I said, all over North America. And the other thing the publisher wanted was that they had to be really easy to find. So it's uh, heavily focused on very common trees and many, many weeds and things that you don't have to go off into you know, expeditions in the woods to find. All right, another one I really, really, really love is John Slaughterly's Southwest Foraging. Uh, this came out just, uh, I think, two years ago. And this, uh, even though it says Southwest, you would think this is mainly more West Texas. And whereas a lot of it is West Texas, you can see I have it marked with things I find, you know, over in East Texas, Central Texas, and so on forth, so forth too. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of things. He does just go usually with one picture of the plant, but then a very detailed explanation or uh, description of the plant. And so, you know, also how to use it. Um, in some cases, some plants he goes more like uh, the Octotillo. He talks quite a bit, multiple pages, because that is such a fascinating plant but really useful for expanding your knowledge of the wild edibles, specifically of Texas, or at least the Southwest. Question. <clears throat> Question. All right. Does your book list what compounds do whatever purported effects and journal articles to back said claims up? Okay, no. The Idiot's Guide Foraging, the publisher specifically requested that I do not include any medicinal properties. That was a, a realm they did not want to go into. So it only covers the edible properties. Okay, next up, uh, Charles W. Kane, The Wild Edible Plants of Texas. So whereas my book covered you know, all of North America, his, he tries to limit it mainly to plants that are extremely common 
in Texas. Uh, he has 60 wild edible plants in this book. There is some overlap, uh, things like elderberry. You talk every edible plant book covers elderberry, uh, greenbrier, a few things like that. But uh, if you can see, oh, curled doc. Uh, again, he usually has just one or two uh, pages or pictures, multiple uh, deep descriptions, how to use it, where to find it. He does include the medicinal uses. You can see that but he does not uh, give the references. That being said, Charles W. Kane, my two favorite medicinal uh, chemistry books are by him, uh, because uh, herbal medicine, because he did actually go deep into the research and in his medicinal chemistry books, he does give references and uh, you know, the, the back supporting data on the medicinal properties of the plants. So Charles W. Kane, The Edible Plants of Texas, really good uh, for just learning what might be edible. And then also by him, he has the Sonoran Desert Food Plants, uh, also by Charles W. Kane. Then even the Sonoran Desert, that's actually uh, California. A number of these plants are found here in Texas, and you can see he does have maps showing where these plants are found. So like the previous one, it's usually just one or two pictures, usually very good pictures um, to show you what the plant looks like. Ugh, it's hard to do this. But distribution, edible uses, medicinal uses, but the map. Uh, so many of the plants in Sonoran Desert food plants are also found across Texas. All right. All right. Oh, ooh, we got a question. Would we be able to find the medicinal properties on your website since it isn't in the book? Yes. Yeah, so one thing I have done is with each plant on the Forging Texas website, well, not all of them yet, but I'm still adding the data. Um, but can you grab me the... This, oops. So some of you may know I'm working on uh, my own book and where I go through and give the, the plant the uses, the leave, you know, how it's used, purpose, preparation. Um, that information has been added to the Foraging Texas website. So there is the medicinal properties. That being said, I do not give the references back to the uh, supporting material just because it's a huge job and it would take forever. Um, maybe someday it will be added there. That being said, remember, I am a chemist, a, a master's in medicinal chemistry, PhD in physical organic chemistry. I need to see proof, uh, scientific Western you know, research proof that the medicinal properties of the plant have been vetted out scientifically. Okay, we talked about the books that are specifically keyed for the Texas Southwest sort of area. Now I wanna talk a bit about some foraging books for uh, again, all of North America, and there's going to be three here by my favorite author, author uh, Sam Thayer. So the first is Nature's Garden, and what I, he goes into a great bit of detail. Um, I have an autographed copy, and just a, a, a just a side note: uh, Sam's father actually died today, so very very sad. Um, I've been blessed to spend quite a bit of time with with Sam, and. There's never enough time to spend with Sam. Uh, I, I wanted to show you. I, I thought I had marked it, had it marked, but I guess it's faded. But um, lots of plants. A lot of these plants are found in Texas, as well as lesser important parts of North America. So the Nature's Garden. And one of the things I like about this is he goes through and he shows multiple pictures, big pictures of the leaf, the flower. Uh, what it looks like at different times of year and so forth. So it's really, really designed not only to tell you if the plant is edible, but actually help you identify plants that you can eat. So Nature's Garden. Uh, is the book on your um, Amazon? Yes. Uh, actually, yeah, stage two. Yeah, Sam Sayer's books are in stage or step two, the digging deeper. So the Forger's Harvest continues on uh, again with about 40 different plants that are found in Texas and multiple pictures of, you know, the bark, the twig, the, the, the tree, all the, you know, it's not just 
trees. It's all sorts of other plants too, but you know what it looks like at different times of the year. His, uh, Sam's books kind of help me guide, well, help guide me in the creation of the Foraging Texas website with lots of pictures and the plant at different types of or times of the year. Okay, and then finally, the incredible wild edibles that just came out. It's only 36 plants on this one. Um, but you can see, so the black mustard and the blackberry and the dewberry. But then there's a bunch on you know, the rest that are also found in Texas. So the yellow ones are found in Texas. So I really recommend, uh, if you're really getting into foraging, Sam Thayer's books, uh, you will not go wrong. You will love it. He goes into details about how to find it, where to find it, what time of year to look for it, and then uh, a lot of ways on how to use it and just some really fascinating facts about the plant. They're just a pleasure to read, really. Okay, you may be wondering when I was going to get to the Peterson's Field Guide, uh, Edible Wild Plants. This is kind of a book of last resort, in my opinion. Um, just because it's not really easy to use by the amateur. You really need to use it as a key guide um, and understand, you know, how to use it. And it, it, it's time consuming. So maybe one of these days I should go through and do a class on how to use Peterson's Field Guides. But the Peterson Field Guide to Edible Wild Plants, it's a great book for telling you if a plant you've discovered and properly identified is edible. But just taking this and going out in the woods and thinking you're going to discover all sorts of wild edible plants, you're not going to unless you have lots and lots and lots and lots of time. So good book to have. Um, like I said, once you build up your plant identification skills, but definitely not one of my first choices, actually. Okay, there's other books that I don't have on the Forging Texas uh, Amazon excuse me, pasta for supper, on the uh, Amazon Forging Texas website that I also do use myself for information and identification. Uh, on the edible side, one is The Edible Wild Plants of the Prairie by Kelly Kitchener. Uh, excellent, excellent book. It's kind of designed for identification because it does have some line drawings. It has the maps, uh, things like that. But it goes into a great bit of detail on how different Native American tribes use the native wild foods that were around here. You know, it says, okay, the Choctaw did this, uh, the Cherokee did this, the uh, Sioux did this, depending on, you know, the plant. Um, so it goes, uh, well, how the Native Americans used it, and then later on how uh, Westerners coming over incorporated it into their own cuisines too. So kind of interesting that way. Not the best for identification, as like I said, it just kind of limits to just drawings, but it's really good to learn more and more historical uses of the wild edible plants. Okay, of course, the Bible of Native American use uh, of plants is the Native American Ethnobotany by Daniel Moorman. Um, huge, huge book. Not plant identification. Um, it just is, you know, words after words after words after words, but it's pretty much the, the compendium of all that is known about Native American ethnobotany. So things that they used for food, things that they used for medicine, things that they used for making baskets, basically every use of, by Native Americans that we know of, of the plants, uh, of North America. So huge, huge, expensive book, but again, really, really good if you want to go deep into the historical uses of plants. And then also along that is the Encyclopedia of Edible Plants of North America, written by a Frenchman, which is kind of funny. Um, but this also uh, is mainly the native plants, the native edible plants of North America. And as before, it is not identification. It's just pages and pages of information, how things were used. Um, but like I said, for, for me, especially answering questions I get from people, this is one of the books I turn to when they ask a question I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. Okay, hold on a second there. Okay, so those were books specifically on edible plants. 
But really the key to learning to forage is learning to identify plants because that really speeds up the process. So now we're going to talk about plant identification books. Are there any questions about this time? No questions. All right. So let's just jump right in with Botany in a Day, The Patterns and Method of Plant Identification by Thomas Elpel. This is a classic book uh, for really anyone wanting to learn plant identification. So the way it works is obviously you can't learn everything in one day. But the premise is there's approximately 152 families of plants, major families. And one of the things that puts a plant, you know, multiple plants in a family is they have uh, very similar structural features. So what botany in a day does is it goes through each uh, family of plants. You know, like here we got the rose family. And it teaches you all the identifying characteristics of that family, what the leaf structure looks like, what the flower structure looks like, what the fruit structure looks like, all these sort of things. So you spend 152 days doing this, uh, learning the different structures of the different plant families. And then when you're out and about, when you see a unknown plant, you uh, have a good shot at at least figuring out what family it's in. And if you know what family it's in, it makes uh, further identification that much easier. So Botany in the Day by Thomas Eppel. Uh, there's a new version out where the drawings are colored in. So I don't know if you can see that. So it's a stone crop family. That's a purslane and so forth. Um, really, really good book for uh, teaching you the families of plants. Now, one I highly recommend that people carry with them is the Little Golden Guide to Weeds from St. Martin's Press. And this is another one where I based a lot of my website design and the Idiot's Guide Forging off this book because it kind of does the same thing where it shows multiple pictures of the plant with the leaf, the seeds, the flower, the leaves, the stems, the full plant, and then a map of where it may be found in the United States. So if you're outside the United States, it's less useful. Now, obviously, this does not cover every weed in existence, but it covers a whole lot of them, especially the most common ones uh, in your yard, in the neighbor's yard, in the abandoned farm down the street, um, things like that. So really useful for identifying the weeds. It does not tell you if the weeds are edible, but once you identified it, then you go and look it up in one of these other books. So St. Uh, Martin's Press also has the Wildflowers book. Again, this is a nice small little pamphlet. They're like six bucks or four bucks used. And these are something you can keep with you uh, just all the time. And it just has the different flowers. It's nice in that the flowers are color coordinated. So you only have to flip through one fifth of the book to find it. Uh, if you know, try and match your mystery flower to one of the wildflowers in this book. And then, of course, the map, too. So really useful uh, just as a day-to-day -day carry, EDC, everyday carry plant book. Very small, easy to carry with you. Uh, along that same vein, if you're just starting out, the Peterson's First Guide to Trees. It's kind of the same thing where it takes, a, well, in this case, there's 243 common and conspicuous trees of North America. And so it gives you the, you know, the leaves and the flower and usually the fruit or the nut uh, to help you identify what tree you might have there in front of you. And 243 trees, there's a good chance the tree you're looking for is in here. And why did we just die there for a second? Okay. <laughs> um, another good one. I'm, I'm probably going through this fast, but remember, after this is done, you'll be able to pause this. And Mini Weather is posting up the links to each. So Wildflowers of Texas, this is another one. This is a bigger book, obviously. And if you can see, like the St. Martin's Guide, it is color coordinated. So you don't have to look through the blue or the red or the yellow or the white. Uh, this was my Bible of wildflowers when I moved down to Texas and trying to figure out what everything was. Really, really good book. Very, very comprehensive uh, hundreds of different wildflower pictures. Um, again, doesn't go into much detail about edible or anything like that. I think maybe you want to... Right? Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. So, but really, really good for identifying the flowers. And the flowers are usually one of the best ways of identifying the plant. 
More recently, uh, Wildflowers by Michael Eason uh, came out, and I got to say, I am thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly in love with this book, too. The, as the uh, other Wildflowers of Texas book, it is color-coordinated, but it has a lot more wildflowers in it than the Gata book. Um, probably a third more, if not more than a third more. But it, I think it's probably the easiest to use, most comprehensive, uh, well, the easiest to use and most comprehensive wildflowers book of Texas. It is, however, kind of large and not easy to keep with you, as opposed to, let's see the other book quick. Oh, just a minute here. So, so this wildflowers of Texas is a bit smaller than this wildflower. So this one's what? Layer them and hold. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a bit smaller, about an inch around the outsides. Yeah. So it covers less flowers, but it's still really useful. Like I said, this one. <laughs> This one's good to, as to just keep in your, your vehicle when you're driving down the road. And this one you keep like in your bathroom or someplace wherever you use your cell phone the most after you've taken pictures of the plants and are comparing it to it. Okay. Uh, another one, we're back to the Peterson's Field Guide. They actually have Peterson's Guide to Southwestern and Texas Flowers. Uh, to my knowledge, Peterson doesn't put out a field guide to any other state's wildflowers. Texas is pretty special that way. But like the previous one, uh, well, first off, this just covers uh, over 15,000, uh, sorry, 1,500, 1,500 plants and illustrations. But in many cases, they're not actual pictures or drawings, so you kind of have to figure out. Like, So you can see pea-like flowers, pinnate leaves, um, you know, or what do we got? Cacti, cylindrical stems. Uh, a lot of cactus. <laughs> there we go. Five too many petals, two sepals, uh, leaves often fleshy or smooth. So you kind of have to really work your way through the book to find out what you're looking for um, until you get the book memorized. And it takes a while to memorize this one. Okay. One book, again, that I really, really love, but it is very hard to find. Um, occasionally it shows up on Amazon. But the range plants of north central Texas. And this is again designed to help property owners. I'm sorry, this is it has one of these spiral bindings, which is great when you're trying to hold it open, but not so great when you're just trying to hold it. But like some of the other plant identification books, it has multiple pictures of the plant, it says where you find it, all sorts of useful uh, descriptions and so forth. But this book can be tricky to find and expensive when you do find it. But Range Plants in North Central Texas, um, it really covers everything. And wow, this is klutzy. It even covers grasses and cactus and stuff. The organization, it is one of those that just kind of goes alphabetically. So the first you know, hundred times or so, you just have to flip through it and try and find your plant by matching pictures. Okay, another one I really like. If you go to my classes, you'll see me talk about this one. The trees, shrubs, and vines of the Texas Hill Country. Now, one thing I have found with this book is, even though it does say Hill Country in there, um, most of these plants are also found in Central and East Texas. Uh, a lot of my experience with this is basically you start in like uh, Wimberley and head east, and you're a little more likely to encounter these plants than, say, heading west, especially when you get really out far in the west. But uh, the red are poisonous, the green are edible, and the blue are medicinal. Uh, the book does not give this information. Well, it does talk about uh, toxicity to animals, but that's not necessarily the same as toxicity to us. Um, but if you go to the Foraging Texas website, one of the posts is the annotated tree shrubs and vines of the Texas Hill Country. And it goes through and tells what each of these, well, each page, yeah, uh, what the plant is. And then on the post, it, it tells if it's edible, medicinal, or poisonous, and then a link to more information. Next one, the trees of East Texas. So we already saw the 
uh, Peterson's first guide to trees, but the Trees of East Texas is probably the comprehensive Bible of all trees in East Texas. And if you start in East Texas and start creeping through the uh, Gulf Coast region and Central Texas, and sometimes even up into the hill country, you will find a lot of these. Now, it usually just relies on a you know, drawing and then a lot of descriptive information on like the leaves, you know, so oblate to oblong, uh, you see base rounded and broadly accumulated. So this, this is a book really for a botanist, someone who's really into identifying plants because it's not just matching pictures. It's matching pictures and then reading a whole bunch and studying the plant, studying the book, studying the plant, studying the book. But again, this was something I used a lot uh, to identify the trees around here. Okay, next one, The Brush and Weeds of the Texas Rangeland. Uh, another one by Texas A&M. This was designed uh, to help landowners identify the plants on their, uh, it's hard to do this, the plants on their property. And it, then it does give information on toxicity to livestock. Um, but it's kind of a, a picture matching book. It, it gives some details on the plants more you know, how big is the leaf? How big is the fruit? If there's fruit. Um, but mainly it's just uh, looking at the pictures and going, yeah, that's, I think that's what I have. Um, so, but again, useful if you are trying to identify plants. And like I said, I get, you know, dozens of, of plant ID requests each week and trying to figure out what they are. These are the books that I'm using to find them. All right. Another I really, really love is Weeds of the West, which is a huge book. I actually ran out of post-it notes, so I didn't finish going through this one. But like the others, multiple big pictures of the plant to help you identify what it is. Um, this one is more the small herbaceous type things, but also including considered weedy grasses. But this one is really weeds. The others are like the trees, the shrubs, the vines. Um, that sort. This is probably the most comprehensive um, guide to weeds, you know, and, and it's kind of interesting because it defines weed as a plant growing where it interferes with the growing of some sort of financially valuable plant. So it's, it's just kind of the philosophy of this book. So it could be, you know, something most of us would consider a wildflower or some other sort of thing, but in this case, it is a weed that gets in the way of other more beneficial in the eyes of the landowner sort of plants. Now, very, very comprehensive book, lots of good stuff in here. Um, again, one of my main go-tos when people hit me with a mystery plant. Uh, the organization, it's, it's a little rough, um, like they have the grasses together, they have the, the the woody weeds, but it's kind of a hunt and peck sort of book to go through. Okay, Field Guide to Broadleaf Herbaceous Plants of South Texas. So now we're now more in the Corpus Christi area. Uh, this is, you can do the hunt and peck and look at the pictures because each plant does have multiple pictures. But then, whoops, I always get the fingers backwards, you know, details on the actual structure. So you need to know what a Corolla is, what a Calyx is, what a pistol is. But from that, it helps you walk through and figure out what the plant is. So start by looking at the picture and then, whoops. So looking at the pictures and then comparing it to the structural features given in the book. But the Broadleaf Herbaceous Guide of South Texas. This works really well if you have the plant in hand or if you know how to take pictures of plants. If you just snap a picture, one picture of the plant, and then try and go to this book and figure it out, you're not gonna be able to do that. You need to take really close up pictures of the flower, of the leaves, all the really minute structures you need to see to identify the, the plant. All right, for those of you who go along the Gulf Coast, there is the Marine Plants of Texas uh, Coast. This basically covers everything from just above the high tide line down into the water itself, including the different seaweeds and sea grasses of the Texas coast. 
um, but mainly it's more like the the things growing right at the edge of the water or in the water um, very very useful book all the way really from you know the Gulf Coast so Florida down you know past Corpus Christi down down into Mexico really uh, very very useful if you're hanging out on the beach, you, you know, bring this along. Like if you're out at Sea Rim State Park, Evelston State Park, uh, like so the beaches down in uh, Padre Island, you can use this to identify the plants that are around there. And not to leave the West Texas people out, the Guide to Plants of the Northern Chihuahuan Desert. This is what I take when I go out to Big Bend or Big Bend Ranch State Park to identify the plants I'm finding out there. Um, oops. Usually it's nice uh, this one because it has your basic photograph but then it also has a line drawing and between the two it makes it a lot easier to focus in on the details uh, and then descriptions where to find it when it will be blooming that sort of thing so very very useful if you're heading out to Big Bend or Big Bend Ranch State Park or even just out you know to really anywhere out um, um, was the, the mountains out there the Chisel Mountains um these are the plants you're going to find so useful there and whereas that one was all the plants this one is the north chihuahuan desert wildflowers so if you happen to be out there after it rains then you get to see all the amazing wildflowers and you use this book to figure out what you're looking at so the northern chihuahuan desert wildflowers useful uh, especially if you're out there in the winter or early spring, uh, maybe a bit less in the summer or early fall. But uh, during the rainy season, when you're going to get the wildflowers, this is the book you want. Very, very useful. Because a lot of these uh, wildflowers, a lot of them aren't found in the rest of Texas. No questions, huh? Okay. One of the more boring topics. Hey, it's play librarian. <laughs> okay. So finally, uh, Cactus of Texas. And I, I, it shouldn't be cacti, but Cactus of Texas, a field guide. And this, it does kind of, if you can see here, whoops. Um, it arranges them by shape of the cactus, but it goes through and helps you identify all the cacti that you're going to find across Texas. So both the hill country, South Texas, West Texas, um, pretty much all the cacti in Texas. Um, so not so much by location, but by shape, overall shape of the cactus is how you go through and find what you're looking for in here. <coughs> okay, so that is the plant identification. Now, unless there are any questions, wow, no questions. So what, continuing on. <laughs> Uh, now we're going to go into mushrooms. Shrooms. So, mushrooms. Shrooms. Wait a minute. What are you saying over there? <laughs> okay. So a couple of books on mushrooms, starting with Michael Coe's 100 Edible Mushrooms with Tested Recipes. So what I like about this book is, okay, first off, even though it's not Texas specific, many, many, many of the mushrooms are found in Texas. Um, but what he does is he starts you out in a grocery store and has you buy a portobello, a button, some oyster mushrooms, a, you know, some of the common mushrooms that are commonly for sale. And he walks you through the dissection of them. So he you know, has you look at the cap, look at the cap size, look at the cap interior, look at the gills. You know, is it a true gill? Is it a false gill? Is it a polypore? Looking at the stem, does the stem have a veil? Does it have a vulva? all these different mushroom features that you need to know to properly identify a mushroom. So he starts off by actually showing you, like, you know, on the oyster mushroom, it has a false gill as opposed to the portobello, which has a true gill. The different features that when he's talking about them later on, when he gets into the edible, I'm trying to find a good, the edible portion, you know, that's a, probably a bad picture. Just a minute. Uh, you know, when he starts talking about the, the, the mushrooms and he gives a, a great deal of detail over the structural features, you know now what he means because you've seen it in a properly identified mushroom, assuming the Kroger or HEB uh, produce manager has properly identified the mushrooms for sale. 
So really, really good introductory text for learning how to identify mushrooms and then going out and identifying mushrooms. Uh, another one I really, really love is Mushrooms of the Southeast because here in the Houston area where I'm located, uh, a lot of these mushrooms are found in this area. And then going north and east of us and even a bit west. But uh, a good portion of Texas, a lot of these mushrooms of the Southeast are found in there. And as far as unknown mushrooms, this is actually the first book I go to. Uh, if I'm faced with a, a brand new mushroom I've never seen before. Because it has, well, it has pictures, but he goes into extensive, proper, in my opinion, detail of the structural features, including the spore print and some other really minute details you, that will help you identify the plant. So as far as unknown mushrooms, not really talking about whether you can eat them or not, but the Mushrooms of the Southeast, I feel, is probably the best uh, just general mushroom guide for the Texas area. Which may upset Meltzer and Meltzer, uh, or Metzler and Metzler, the Texas Mushrooms, a field guide. This is uh, one that I, this was the first Texas mushroom book I bought because, you know, Texas Mushrooms. Um, and it's really good to start with, but I would not use this book. Uh, I do not feel this book gives enough information on identification of the mushrooms and other possible mushrooms that they could be to use it as a guide for just eating unknown mushrooms. So usually he'll have just one, or they will just have one picture. They will talk about like what zones they're found and information, you know, a good description but not great descriptions. And with mushrooms, you need great descriptions. So um, if you want to just uh, a quick guide to kind of flip through to see what might be, you know, the strange mushroom in your yard might be, this is good. But uh, again, I, I don't feel it is truly enough in every case to properly identify a mushroom enough to eat. But because it has Texas mushrooms, I'm always asked, is that a good book? And it, it's an okay book. Of, like It's in the top three mushroom books for Texas. It really is. Um, but with anything uh, you're gonna eat, any unknowns, you want to be able to cross-reference it with something else. So Texas mushrooms is good, but then definitely have one of the other books too to cross reference back and forth to, you know, so you have two different authors telling you the structural features you want. Um, they should match, but uh, they each focus on slightly different things. And so you may end up with uh, a little bit of different uh, information. I mean, the information will be the same, but, you know, more information just to make sure what you're looking at is what you think it is. Okay. Uh, also, the mic... Um, Myco Medicinals, the information treats you on mushrooms. This is by Paul Stemmitz. Um, it's probably the probably the top top mushroom researcher in the nation. And if you are into medicinal mushrooms, this is the book you want. And one of the great things about it is he actually does go and give, as you can see it, the references, the scientific journal articles that support the information that he's talking about, the medicinal properties of the mushrooms. So if you are, you know, like me, you need the scientific, I'm trying to just open up here, the scientific information, uh, proof that a particular plant, or in this case mushroom, has a medicinal property, uh, very deep detail in the mycomedicinals. Okay, um, at this point, we might end a little early because uh, we don't seem to have a lot of questions. We can hang out. We can chat. If you have questions, we can have questions. I'm not going into the medicinal plant books tonight. I'm saving that for a future episode. Okay, there she is. You want to get into? Mini, mini, right there. There we can all gather Hi, around. Hey. Okay, so next week, actually, the two of us are taking a photography class Wednesday evening, so we'll be at that. Uh, this one will probably be dancing or cooking or otherwise making our lives uh, tasty and wonderful. So um, not next week, but then in the week after. Uh, however, 
this one is starting up something that will have her busy every Wednesday night. And so either I train this one I'm just gonna, <laughs> to, to do the job and we continue on Wednesdays, or maybe we move it to Thursdays. I'm not sure. Maybe if you want, I'll put a poll in or just say keep it on Wednesdays or move it to Thursdays. Um, other than that, still no questions? Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Wow. Okay. People so, are saying they're going to need a small fortune to buy all those books. Yeah. Though. So, like I said, no on the. <laughs> well, that's not you. Hi. This is what I want. Okay. So, the. Ooh. The ones that I. I what, we go we got a question. question. All right. Okay. Hey, Mr. Paul Vorderbergen hey. asks Have you found Writers of the Purple Sage by Zane Gray helpful in your studies? Okay, so Writers of the Purple Sage. I, I read that probably four or five years ago. No. <laughs> oh, another one. If if anyone ever says read Clan of the Cave Bears, uh, because it's filled with all sorts of medicinal plants. Yeah, it's filled with medicinal plants that are not identified. It's like she grabbed some leaves off the bush and applied it to the wound. And the wound, yeah, they don't say actually what plants they are. Um, very few fictional books go into detail about actual edible medicinal plants. Um, they usually just make up things like the King's Foil and Lord of the Rings. It is obviously yarrow from the properties, but not yarrow from the description. So that always kind of irritated me. It's like, come on, Tolkien, you could have at least got that right. There's, oh, there's another question. question, another question. Miss Julie Gracie asks, we have a few minutes. Can we talk current forages? Oh, okay, so what's available right now? If you go to the Foraging Texas website, um, or did I take it out? Oh, here we go. So find by season. You can actually look on the Foraging Texas on the right-hand side, the find by season, clicking on spring, fall, summer, winter, and it'll bring up lots and lots and lots of plants for you to, to eatify. Okay, but I have hearing we have lots of questions. So what yep. is they're more flooded in. Ms. Julie Gracie asks, do you use elbow bush berries? Can I eat them and maybe pickle them? Good question. So the elbow bush berries are edible. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. The elbow bush berries are edible. Um, they kind of remind me of greenbrier berries in that they're, they're kind of, eh, there's nothing overly spectacular, spectacular about them. I've never tried pickling them. I suspect it would end up being kind of like pickled chewing gum. But the the elbow bush berries, they are ripe right now. I've gotten a number of, ooh, Chickasaw plums. Chickasaw plums are coming into ripeness too. If you're up in the central Texas, Dallas area, and then out west from there, Chickasaw plums are good. But the, the elbow bush, they're edible, but they're nothing to write home about. All right. How do we get you to Northeast Texas for a walk? Okay, uh, so you can reach me at Meriwether at foragingtexas.com. There's a link on do, 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 the website. Um, but there's a couple of things. Where is there? Somewhere, yeah, somewhere around here, there is a link to email me. The things you need to supply are a piece of property, several acres with multiple... Like it. Oh. It's <laughs> Sorry, cute guy. <laughs> my cousin <laughs> i know but anyway <laughs> so uh we need uh several acres if possible uh ideally uh some with woods some with water some with fields um but the bigger thing you need is well there's you need permission to, to forage there so if it is a city park or state park you need to talk to them um and they may say yes uh they may say no um, one of the ways it works is they get a cut of the class fees, so that can help them. Um, but if you want it on private property and you are inviting a bunch of strangers, and I mean, not saying that foragers are strange, but they are people unknown to you, you need really, really, really good insurance because you don't always know, A, if the person may be a klutz, step in a gopher hole, break their ankle and sue you. You want to make sure you're covered there. 
and B, you want to make sure you have accessible bathrooms, so the, the lavatories that all the students can use, including any special needs uh, type things, so like uh, physically challenged bathroom facilities, ramps, bars, that sort of thing. Um, now, if you just want to do a private class, obviously the, the requirements are uh, a little bit lighter, at least as far as insurance and the uh, lavatory facilities. What else? All right, Uncle Paul asks, wait, what about melange? 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 Mel melange? Melange. Melange? Melange. Melange. Yes. You mean the big alien puddings that attack tennis players? <laughs> right. That's a Monty Python reference, but me and Paul go way back because he's my brother. Okay, do we have another? What caliber firearm is best for hunting plants? Okay, for hunting plants, I find 22 caliber is usually enough to take it down for most plants. Uh, some of the bigger trees, I've gone up to a 50 caliber, um, but generally the plants I hunt, small calibers. Um, the main use for the, the firearms also is defense against squirrels. They know me, they hate me. They're after me, they're out to get me. All right, Miss Julie Gracie asks, I pickled magnolia flowers, what should I do with them? Okay, pickled magnolias flowers. If you've ever been to a sushi ref restaurant and they have the pickled seaweed there that uses just like a little uh, cleanser between different dishes and so forth, or use it as a seasoning, but use the pickled magnolia, shred it, and then just use it as a little bit of seasoning, kind of like a relish. Uh, say like on hot dogs, on hamburgers, really anywhere where you want to put a really neat f kind of a pickled sauerkrauty magnolia. F right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's like she's breathing heavy in my ear. <laughs> um, so use the pickled magnolia buds as a seasoning uh, to just, you know, just a little bit to jazz up the flavor of other things. What else do we have? Nothing else. Nothing else? Not the squirrels. Okay. That's what she said. The squirrel. I know they're out there watching me. Oh, no, it's you. Drive you nuts. <laughs> okay. So, um, side note. What we just did here now, this just random questioning asking. It was a whole mess, but fun. Yeah, yeah but uh, a lot of the classes in the future, some of you might, if you haven't seen in a while, you realize I was spending way too much time preparing for these classes. Or, well, yeah, I guess it's a class and ignoring these people and so they uh, kind of showed me that i'm in the wrong there and so i have greatly reduced the amount of prep time for these classes so it's going to be a lot of free-flowing things um so like i said next week there won't be one the week after uh talking about medicinal plant books that i like uh then sometime i think it's like june 12th ish or somewhere in there uh, I'm actually bringing uh, Dr. Brendan Laurie in, uh, a professor uh, here in Texas, and we are going to have kind of a free form discussion. Uh, he's a fascinating dude. He has the, I uh, can't remember the name of his website, I'm sorry, but uh, he's an ecologist, biologist uh, type thing, and for many years he would travel around giving a presentation on how zombies actually could biologically occur, uh, occur based on uh, different viruses and the effects of viruses that we know uh, and also some fungi. So like possible biological ways to unleash a zombie apocalypse. Not that I recommend unleashing a zombie apocalypse. Okay, any other questions? Nope, but people definitely do like the idea of random questions. Okay, because I'm a random Free sort questions. of person, and oh, yeah. so are these two. Yeah, wow, right. okay, so we managed to fill 55 minutes of your life with us. Awesome, thank you, thank you for spending the time. Uh, any questions that come to you after we sign off, I will check and uh, follow up on. Of course, mini weather here is getting really good at answering questions and uh, that sort of thing. So, for now, I guess I will just say, uh, oh, I have no words of wisdom. 
Um, just be excellent to one another. <laughs> Party <laughs> on, <laughs> dudes! Oops, Rock there we on. Go. Rock, no, it's a Bill and Ted oh. reference. Imagine I was Abraham Lincoln. Okay, never mind. Go watch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. That's my words of wisdom. Okay, bye.